All right, so hey, that's all I got around the SEC. Let's kick it to our interview with Mike Griffith, very gracious, giving us his time. No one covers the Georgia Bulldogs as well as Mike Griffith of Dog Nation. So I'm very, very eager to talk some Georgia football with him. All right, hey, we're pleased to once again be joined by Mike Griffith. Nobody does a better job covering the Georgia Bulldogs than Mike Griffith when he works for the AJC's DogNation.com. He was the Football Writers Association Beat Writer of the Year for 2018. Mike, thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, You bet, Michael. Now, I got to start with this because this is certainly the biggest topic right now in Athens. Stetson Bennett making the decision to return. Uh, Thoughts on that? And, you know, I'm not trying to put the cart in front of the horse, but the way I see it, you know, this is going to have to be an offensive-led team next season, potentially, with all the losses on the defensive side of the ball. So is it too unrealistic to say that uh, Stetson should be an off, off-season Heisman candidate? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure who the starter is going to be. You know, Kirby's a, a year-to-year, game-to-game type of guy. Um, you know, there's right now, as we sit here in you know January, uh, you know, George has been active looking for quarterbacks in the portal. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't, the recruiting never stops, you know, a year ago at this time, uh, we thought JT Daniels was the guy and he actually emerged from SEC media days last summer as the Heisman trophy favorite, according to odds makers. So things can change fast. And certainly in the Georgia quarterbacks room, um, things can change fast. There are some very high heralded players, you know, uh, that have been behind, uh, well, one of them was actually ahead of, Ste- uh, ahead of Stetson on the depth chart last year, Carson Beck, a former, um, Mr. Football from Florida won a state championship down there. And, and I think Carson Beck will compete this spring. And Brock Vandergriff was a very highly touted five-star from, you know, right here near Athens, uh, 10 miles away from the school, essentially, and uh, flipped from Oklahoma to Georgia, pretty stocky 6'3", 215 guy with a pretty strong arm and a pretty good ability to run the ball. And then they signed a, the guy that shattered a lot of the high school records formerly held by Deshaun Watson, uh, and Gunnar Stockton, who's coming in as an incoming freshman, so I don't think uh, I don't think I'd put any cart ahead of any horse. I don't even know if I'd put a horse ahead of the cart because <laughs> you, I just you know with Kirby Smart and quarterbacks, you, you really just you really just never know. Hmm. Well, speaking of the quarterbacks, you Mike were the one that broke this news when it was official. J.T. Daniels in the transfer portal. And that was soon followed by receiver Jermaine Burton. What were your thoughts on on that duo uh, entering the portal there in a short period of time together? Well, I don't know if they were you know necessarily connected at the time. You know, I think JT just recognized that you know as talented as as he is and as much as he accomplished in a short amount of time, I, I just think Kirby Smart's got a different vision for a quarterback. He you know he wants some more mobility. Um, you know, and I think that once JT got hurt, I think, and they switched, I don't think Kirby wanted to readjust the offense and, and, and maybe JT would have wanted, I know, you know, I think Kirby, um, made it pretty clear that he wanted him back, but it's just too much of a crap shoot. And yes, there's competition, but you know, it's possible to be, I don't know how to say it, but you know, the competition does, the results of the competition doesn't always lead to who they choose to start. Um, it could have something to do with the personnel. It could have something to do with, um, you know, just a, a lot of those. I mean, even Todd Munkin, when Todd Munkin was talking about it last year, he said, who knows what's behind the next decision. And, and so, and he's the offensive coordinator. So I just, I just think it's too predictable of a situation, unpredictable of a situation for JT and I think, um, you know, he probably wants to go somewhere where it's a little bit clearer, cleaner picture. Um, and, uh, you know, he'll he'll take his talents elsewhere. Jermaine Burton was a guy who just didn't get a lot of targets. I mean, uh, you know, once Georgia shifted out of the five wide, four wide, you know, pro style air raid stuff that JT was doing and kind of went to the three tight end play action, um, more of a balanced, balanced attack in terms of run pass ratio with Stetson, a lot of those receivers lost targets. I mean, Brock Bowers had something like 56 catches, which was about the same. If you look at Brock Bowers' numbers, it was about the same as the number two and number three wide receivers combined. So well, receivers really didn't get out of throws in this style of offense. There wasn't. There was an occasional shot played, but for the most part, it was a controlled passing game to the tight end and the running backs, high percentage throws. 
and a lot of run after the catch, uh, which is which is smart, right? It's what you see in the NFL, and, and Todd Munkin can do it a lot of different ways, and and the talent dictated um, that. And Burton was the guy that was injured, so uh, early on, so he kind of fell behind. You know, like JT, if there's a thread here, Michael, in the Georgia players that you're seeing in the portal, m- many of them, if not most of them, have been injured at some point. And, um, you know, if you're injured, you know, what do they say? The best ability is the availability. Right. So I, I don't think that's a coincidence. Now, what does, in your mind, does winning the national championship, what does that do for Kirby Smart's legacy, the, the Georgia native, the former Bulldog himself? I mean, is this, this guy's, is he ever going to have to buy another drink in Athens if, if he had to already? Yeah, you know, I don't think he has time to stop and drink. To your point, uh, <laughs> I, I, I just I, every now and then he takes time to smile. I mean, Kirby's pretty restless. Kirby uh, is not a complacent guy. He, his time management skills are what he's infamous for, and works really hard. Um, you know, these days in today's society, you'd like to think a national championship would seal a legacy, but you know, um, you know, you just take a look around at you know LSU had a couple guys win national championships in the last ten years. They're both out of football, right? Mm-hmm. Things can change fast, and um, you know, there's just there's just no guarantees. You know, things change so quickly. The landscape is shifting. There's a new model now with the NIL. Not to derail your question, but you know, it's almost like there was a formula that was needed under the previous rules to be successful, and now you have one-time transfer and NIL. And now the school that's able to adjust the quickest and the best of that will be successful. So uh, I think it remains to be seen. Uh, Georgia's in a great position. They're on the pole position, being the national champion, to take advantage of these rules. And I think that's what it really means, is that it puts Georgia out front. Everybody wants to be a part of a good thing. It's a shot in the arm for uh, recruiting. It's a shot in the arm for fundraising. It's a shot in the arm for you know licensing and marketing. It's a shot in the arm um, you know, for maybe tying yourself to corporations, right? Because I see, to me, that's where I think NIL is going, is corporate sponsorship um, with a lot of these NIL deals, major corporate sponsorship. You know, is it realistic to think George could land Delta or Coca-Cola? I don't know. I mean, then then what happens? The Alabama people don't want to drink it, you know? But then you got Tennessee, right, with Pilot <laughs> Gas and Oil. I mean, did Georgia people not pull over because they know every time they're fueling up that pile, uh, Pilot Gas stations are – uh, owned by the Tennessee booster Jim Haslam, you know. So I, I, I it's the world ahead. You know, I, I, my head starts hurting when I try to think about uh, just how many different things are ahead for college football and and how the model is going to have to be reshaped with these NILs and this one-time transfer rule. Now, for so long, Georgia and by association, of course, Kirby Smart couldn't get over Alabama, couldn't beat Nick Saban. Now that they've done it, and of course, they've done it on the biggest stage. Do you consider Georgia an equal to Alabama, or or did you already see it that way? Well, I mean, a lot of people couldn't get by Alabama, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> the fact that Georgia got there every year was was pretty good. Um, well, not every year, but you know, four out of five years for Kirby, his first four out of five years. And um, you know, listen, Alabama is probably the national championship favorite going into next year. Mm-hmm. I don't think anything changes. I, I, you know, I I guess there was a stigma there when Nick won his first 24 in a row against former assistants, and then Jimbo beat him, and you know now Kirby's beat him. But um, you know, well, I guess what they lost six first round picks. I mean, at some point Alabama's got to reload. You think? Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens this next year. I mean, I, right now I'd take Alabama over the field. Uh, for the national championship with what they've got coming back and and what I saw from Bryce Young. um, I mean, he was unbelievable. Now, what do you think the plan will be for defensive coordinator with uh, Dan Lanning, of course, going off, taking the Oregon job? Where where does Kirby Smart turn? I know he's got some some great in-house candidates. Do you think that's where he'll go with his next defensive coordinator hire? Well, so far it's Will Muschamp and Glenn Schumann. Uh, I don't, I don't have any reason to believe that it'll change. Um, you know, Muschamp's obviously a, a proven commodity uh, as a coordinator, certainly, and and you know had some success as a head coach. But all that experience is it's awesome for Kirby. I, I think Will Muschamp was a big part of last season's national championship. I mean, you had another veteran voice to the room, and with all the work that Georgia needed in its secondary, it was in a major reload in the secondary and. And Will Muschamp was there along with Kirby to get those guys more individual attention. Jamal died, the secondary coach. I mean, they had to catch up fast. I mean, they lost like eight guys from their secondary from the year before. And and obviously you saw in the end, the secondary came through with Keely Ringo. But 
I, I think it's I think it's going to stay the way it is, you know, with with Schumann and and Muschamp being named the co-defensive coordinators. I think that you know Schumann's kind of a rising star, much like Dan Lanning was a few years ago when he took over the defense after Mel Tucker left in 2019. And you know, in in three seasons, Dan you know parlayed that into the head coaching job at Oregon. And you know, you look at how Mel Tucker's doing now at Michigan State, and you look at another former Kirby assistant, Sam Pittman. Uh, over there at Arkansas and Shane Beamer, you know, the success he had. These are all guys that have come through Georgia. I mm-hmm. mean, that's, that's not too shabby. We're talking about four former Kirby smart assistants. Now, granted, that wasn't their only stop, but, you know, for Georgia to have that association, um, you know, I, I think that's a positive thing. I think it makes Georgia an attractive place to work. And, and uh, you know, Will Muschamp, I don't know if he wants another go around as a head coach or not. I think he likes the time he's having with his family. Um, although, you know, he's got a commitment as, a, as an assistant uh, defensive coordinator there, co-defensive coordinator. So I feel like that, that position is pretty solidified. I'm more curious, um, you know, what happens on offense with Cortez Hankton going to LSU and, you know, how might they fit that gap? You know, who might they promote? Um, could they hire a, a true quarterbacks coach that actually, you know, on field, you know, I know Buster Faulkner is a guy that's been out on the road recruiting and, you know, he was kind of an offensive analyst role they hired from uh, his previous position as a Southern Miss offense coordinator. Might he be promoted uh, to an on-field, assi- uh, full all-time assi- on-field assistant? Maybe let Munkin oversee the receivers. Um, you know, it's, Munkin's kind of a receiver guru. Um, or will they bring in somebody new? Um, so, you know, Kirby likes to slow play these things. Um, he's pretty thorough when it comes to his hires. And right now, I think the priority is on the recruiting trail. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's Perfect for my last question for you, Mike. I really appreciate all your time. I keep hearing Arch Manning really loves Georgia, and I know you know no one can predict where these recruiting battles are going to go, but uh, can you share anything at all with the recruitment with Arch Manning and, and how Georgia's looking as a, a potential landing spot for uh, the quarterback that uh, everybody's going to have their eye on all summer? Yeah, it's, it's really, you know, to me, fascinating, you know, probably one of the most high profile recruits and man, quite some time. I can't even think, you know, the man name travels. And mm-hmm. A lot of people have been waiting on Arch for a long time at a lot of schools, a lot of time and money has been invested into his recruitment by many, many places. Uh, I did see um, earlier this week, Kirby and Matt Luke and Todd Munkin, at least those three were at his basketball game. And that's a lot of manpower hours at a critical time of the year. So uh, that says a lot. Uh, you know, I don't think Kirby hadn't made any secret of it that he really wants to land Arch Manning. Kirby really has a passion for recruiting. Um, it, it makes you wonder a little bit about the quarterback picture now, right? I mean, if you're a redshirt freshman or an incoming freshman or, or a true freshman at Georgia um, and you haven't had a chance to start yet, you know, if you're back, Van, Van de Griff, back Stockton and, and Arch Manning comes in, what, is, what does that mean for you? Right? Uh, mm-hmm. How bit does the transfer portal get busy again, and what promises have to be made to land Archman or do any? I see. I have a hard time believing that that the Mannings, just with my experience with you know knowing how calculated Peyton is and thorough he is, um, there's going to be a plan for him wherever he goes, whether it's to redshirt a year and play or play. Uh, but the Mannings will be very, very, very involved in this, and I think Todd Munkin does have a background with Peyton, so uh, that makes sense. Um, I just wonder about, you know, and I, I call it collateral damage because, you know, that's just where we're at with one-time transfers and high-profile recruits and NIL deals. Uh, if, if a school is going to, you know, or if a, if the, if a player is going to have an arranged NIL deal and be receiving a certain amount of money, there's going to be an expectation for him to play. And it gets complicated. Or if you promise a recruit an opportunity, that affects the guy that's already there. And um, you know, it's not just at Georgia. You know, this is, this is happening everywhere. This is not unique to Georgia or Alabama. It's just those two schools are the tip of the spear, and so they're they're in the focal point. They're they're where the bright lights get shined, right? Um, you know, you're having me on because I cover the national championship team and how do things look here? Well, you know, you could call 13 other guys that cover SEC teams, and the names and the faces may change. But the story remains the same. This is what's happening. This is what the current rule structure, uh, excuse me, yeah, the current rule structure, um, which is kind of an oxymoron, this is what it's producing. It's it's like Bill O'Brien said, um, you know, in one of his press conferences leading up to the championship game, it's kind of like free agency only without any rules. So 
Um, you know, that's why Nick Saban wants to see some legislation. It's why Greg Sankey and presidents and athletic directors are going to be talking about this. Um, because right now, Michael, it is, it is the wild, wild west out there. And it's hard to predict or project anything. Yeah, that's a really great point. Well, I don't want to take up any more of your time. He's Mike Griffith, AJC, Dog Nation, got to check it out. The Football Writers Association, Beat Writer of the Year, named in January 2018. Mike, thank you so, so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. All right, appreciate it, Michael. All right, so just want to say thanks again to Mike for hopping on the line, talking some Georgia Bulldogs football. That was some terrific, terrific stuff. And a great way to head into the weekend. So just want to say thanks once again to Mike and don't forget to give him a follow at Mike Griffith 32 and check out all his work at dognation.com. But that's going to do it. Sorry for the delay on this episode. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you on the next one.